Some of the things that I wanted to raise, largely on behalf of Socialist Alliance, are, are really important. In addition to my political activity as a, a feminist and a, and a socialist, I also pay the bills by working in a service that supports women who are experiencing domestic violence. So every day I see the, the, the really devastating consequences for women and children of a society that's, that's based on gender inequality. And violence against women is, is truly endemic. I mean, it's everywhere. But most of it still occurs within the family walls, within, within the domestic sphere, by people who are known to or related to, to the woman who's, who's being abused. Most rapes, too, are committed by um, people who are known to the, to, to the woman. Um, and rape within marriage or within relationships, we really still have no idea how pervasive that is because it's, it's still not reported as a, as a crime on the whole. Based on the few statistics that are available, we do know that about one in three women experience sexual assault um, or violence of some other sort um, at some time during their lives. And it, it begs the question that how can something which is so widespread um, and, and affects so many women's lives just remain largely, um, largely silent even, even in our society. We all just carry on. Why isn't there a huge you know, public outcry about that. And I wanted to spend the, the time that I've got today just talking about why violence is, is not an, an anomaly um, in, in capitalist society, how it's totally embedded in one of the main institutions of that society, um, that being the family, and also what that means for our battle to free all women from all forms of violence and from the sort of systemic inequality um, that allows misogyny to flourish even in this supposedly civilised society that we live in. One of the, the first writers to identify that violence against women and children um, is woven into the very fabric of the family from its beginnings was Frederick Engels. Yeah, a man. <laughs> but I guess I just wanted to urge every feminist in the room that if you haven't already, and if you read just one book this year, to read Frederick Engels' Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State. That was a, it was a really groundbreaking um, piece of analysis based on, 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 scientific, on scientific research. And in it, Engels explains how the, the subordination of women um, as a sex was the very foundations of the development of the institution of the family. Um, and the family, in turn, provides the necessary framework um, for social classes, for class society to develop, eventually into, into capitalism as we know it. The family angle said, and it, it's, I think it's truer <laughs> or clearer today um, than ever, um, is the, the central pillar, even though it's considered private, you know, it's the domestic sphere, it's the central pillar of um, economic and social relations um, in, in capitalism. Without it, without the family as we know it today, capitalism could not survive. Um, it, it, it would crumble. And that's because the family serves several um, indispensable functions, functions that no other institution in, in our society um, um, serves. First of all, it privatises the costs, um, most of the work, of reproducing people, uh, people who are do the work in society, people who create the wealth that goes into the pockets of the, of the capitalist class, reproducing people on a day-to-day -day basis, feeding, clothing and so on, but also generationally. Um, that's, that's the role of the family. But most of the privatised work that's done within the family is, is done by, by women um, who, because they bear children, have been made responsible for the, the care of all family members all the time through, through the family. So that's the first thing. Secondly, he talks about how the family plays a role of socialising us or the, the population to accept authority. In the context of the family, it's the authority of the father, the patriarch, so on. Um, and that then extends into society, into accepting the authority of those with more power, um, more control than, than us. Thirdly, it means that the family, through inheritance from one generation to the next, means that the wealth um, of the, the, the ruling class is safeguarded within that class. It can be passed on. Um, and fourthly, that gender division of labour, that division of the responsibilities of men and women within the family, defines um, women's sort of primary role as being in the home, 
as mother, daughter, um, whatever, whatever it might be. And that in turn allows them, when they go out into what's considered their secondary area of, of work, paid work, allows them to be super exploited, to be paid less, to be employed as casuals and so on, because it is still considered the secondary role, not the primary role that, that, that women have. And that's not saying that women's oppression is, is or can be simply reduced to one of economics and the sort of role that the family plays in, in capitalist economy. Women's oppression begins in the family, but it's, it's reinforced, um, it's perpetuated through all the institutions um, and social relations of, of capitalism. The state, you know, the courts, the laws and so on, the marketplace, the mass media, religious institutions and beliefs and so on. Those sort of dominant ideas about you know, how women should be, how we should act, how we should think, how we should dress and so on and so on, um, are often how we as women experience our oppression on the day-to-day -day basis. It's the ideas about what we should and shouldn't be and what we can and, can and can't do, certainly in the advanced capitalist, capitalist countries. But it's understanding that economic or, or that material basis for, for women's oppression in the family as an economic unit, not just at the level of ideas, that really um, helps us, I think, to understand what we need to do to then free all women of all of those um, aspects of, the, of their second class status, whether it's as you know, sexual objects, whether it's as super exploited workers, um, whether it's as, as victims of, of, of ongoing violence and so on. That is, gender inequality is, is rooted in, it begins in this, this institution um, of capitalism called the family, um, but inequality flows well beyond um, the economic basis into all spheres of our social and cultural and sexual and every aspect of our lives. When you think about the family, though, as playing that sort of role, both for capitalism, class society, and for women, you can start to make sense of the, um, all of those legal and ideological sort of um, restrictions or impositions that are associated with the family in, you know, in modern society, whether it's you know, heterosexuality being the correct form of sexuality, um, marriage ceremonies, the wedding industry is massive um, in, in capitalist society, monogamy, the importance of monogamy within relationships, um, the pressure on women to have children, all of these things um, window dress but bolster up that uh, basic institution which is essential to the whole economic um, foundations of, of, of capitalism. In the dog-eat-dog -dog world of, of capitalism, it's also true that the family is often the only place where women and children do actually are able to get um, some emotional support, that, that personal, um, personal sort of fulfilment. Um, and that's a huge contradiction. Um, within the family and, and, and for capitalism. The fundamental role of the family um, remains one that without which um, capitalism couldn't continue. Coming from that sort of um, understanding, I guess, um, of the absolutely fundamental economic role that the family and women's oppression within it and from it play in keeping all the wheels of capitalism turning and, and, and so on, you can then understand why it is that, you know, in the 21st century and in, in, in our um, modern advanced society, that while um, the, the, the mass movements for women's rights, the, the first and the second waves of, of feminism, while they won um, ex really significant gains for women, formal legal, legal equality, um, they created a very high and persisting, I think, expectation and acceptance within society that men and women are or should be equal. Um, despite all of that, women still don't have full economic and, and, and social equality. They're still not free from, from violence. Those first and second waves of feminism, the, the turn of the last century and then from the sort of late 1960s to, to early 1980s, uh, the, the, the achievements of those, of those um, huge battles for change um, were, were, were incredibly, incredibly significant. You know, women now legally, formally, um, have the right to equal pay, um, won the vote, the right to stand for parliament, even be elected as prime minister, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the problem 
I guess the, the, the shortfall of those movements and, and the, the basis upon which today we still see all of these manifestations of, of women's oppression, in particular in the form of violence against women, is that they were not allowed, and there was it's another whole discussion how those movements were very consciously demobilized and co-opted and so on by, by by the ruling class, but they were not allowed to develop to the extent of actually um, dismantling those basic economic and social relations of, of, of capitalism. They certainly challenged, those movements challenged, at least the second wave that I was a part of challenged the, some of the, the key institutions and ideas that come with capitalism. But capitalism remains, um, the family as that basic unit of, of capitalism and all the ideas that go with it um, remain. And the consequence of not dismantling that foundation um, of, of women's oppression is that all of the hard-won reforms, and they've been really hard-won, um, that have been made by women for women, um, are constantly under attack. Capitalism is always tempting to take them back, particularly in periods of crisis for capitalism, um, which we've seen especially over the last, the last few decades, where you know, capitalism is, as a system, as a global system, is facing enormous, enormous challenges, has really deep problems. And therefore, the, the, the viciousness, the concerted campaign to take back every single gain that those movements were able to make for women and which cost capitalism, whether it was publicly funded childcare um, and so on, that, that, that offensive um, is, is, is very, is escalated um, in, in periods of crisis. I was going to, but I won't because of time, um, talk a little bit about how that, um, that offensive by capitalism around the world at the moment um, actually impacts uh, well, certainly impacts more so on women, um, but also particularly on working class women who in the advanced capitalist countries, but especially in the, um, in the third world, are in fact falling further and further away from the formal rights that were won by the movements, let alone, um, let alone full equality. But it is something that I think is really worthwhile people, you know, um, learning about and, and becoming familiar with exactly what is happening to, to women as a whole um, under this, this um, sort of current offensive, uh, offensive of capitalism. Um, because it's important that we um, understand where we fit in this system which now is totally globalised, um, this economic system, but also the social relations that come with capitalism um, that, 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 that are totally, totally globalised. What I do want to finish up by saying, though, is that I think, I mean, the, the ways in which capitalism um, through the family um, utilises and maintains gender inequality and the, the subordination of women are very, there's deep contradictions within them. And we're seeing that at the moment. This sort of neoliberal drive to uh, force more of the responsibility for looking after children, the elderly, the sick and so on, back into the family to cut costs um, for, for the state, to reimpose on what will mainly be women, the responsibility for all of that work and so on. That's happening at a time where women's participation in the workforce has never been higher or, or more consistent. Um, and capitalism as a whole doesn't have any real interest in driving women out of the workforce en masse. Um, women play a really important role for capitalism in the workforce, which is that they are, um, because they are paid less on average, because they take casual part-time work and so on, their workforce participation can be used to, to drive down um, the, the wages and working conditions of all workers of the whole working class. That, that's, a, that's a really important consideration for, for capitalism. I think that the reserve army of labour is the way in which um, Marx talked about women um, and the role that they can play um, in, the, in, in the workforce for, for capital. But the other thing is that most families today rely on two incomes to survive. And if women did leave the, or forced out of the workforce or force en masse, the, the resulting social uh, conflict, the, the instability 
for, for capitalism um, would be would be really significant. So the, the, the pressures on the family unit to both be the traditional family unit with a very clear sexual division of labour between men and women and the needs of capitalism in the labour force, um, that contradiction is growing and the pressure the pressure's enormous. Um, it's an increasingly unworkable, unworkable reality. If the, that understanding of, of women's oppression is not just being some sort of unfair consequence of, but as being a foundation stone, um, an indispensable pillar of the sort of society that we live in, that does lead to certain conclusions about what's needed for gender inequality to be eradicated. If you have um, study and, and come to the same conclusion that um, the economic role that women play for capitalism um, is, is indispensable, then you conclude, you, you automatically led to the conclusion that what is actually required is to, to liberate women is a revolutionary transformation of, of society. And I guess, I mean, for me, revolutionary feminism sort of encapsulates what, you know, um, what, 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 what I'm talking about. The dismantling of, of that economic system which is based on, on the family and all the social relations that go with it, that is the, the, the development or the move towards socialism, trying to create a society which is not based on classes. Um, that is going to be, going to be necessary um, for, for women to be fully liberated, to have full um, equality, full freedom from violence and, and, and so on. And it means then for me as a feminist that the um, that sort of struggle for, for for socialism or against capitalism and all its all its sort of forms of oppression, whether it's against people of colour, LGBTI community, the working class, and so on, that struggle is just completely integrated with and part and parcel of my struggle as a feminist for for, for women um, for, for for women to to be free. But equally, I think that for um, women's liberation to not be considered an absolutely integral part of any left or progressive struggle is, is a dead end. So for those leftists, for example, who, who talk about the fact, you know, women's gender equality can be um, dealt with or achieved after the revolution, or even that, well, for socialists, it's not a priority to participate in this feminist campaign or that um, that campaign for a women's right. It's not essential, it's more urgent to you know, campaign for the rights of the working classes as a whole through the trade union movement or whatever. whatever. Those sorts of views, I think, are, are a dead end, both for feminism and, and, and for socialism. And I just mention that because there is an ongoing discussion on the left, which I think is really, really important about how we, as socialists, as well as as, as women and feminists, relate to the, this new um, flourishing of, of campaigns against violence against women and, and for women's rights. Personally, I'm extremely optimistic about um, the, the prospects for the feminist movement because I think that when you look at what's happening in the world, look beyond Australia, look at what's happening in the world and see women absolutely leading the revolutions in Latin America, for example, or at the centre of the mass, the mass upsurge against the austerity in Europe, or see the new women's movement, the new feminist movement, that's actually arising out of the struggles for democracy in the Middle East. These, this is the context in a global capitalism, their struggles, their victories are ours in Australia as well. And I think that feminism is becoming much more integrated into it, sort of at the heart of these struggles of peoples all over the world as capitalist crisis gets deeper and deeper who are saying, no more, enough, and are starting to look at alternative societies. And in the case of Venezuela, Cuba, um, Bolivia, are starting to create alternative societies in which all people are liberated and women are the majority of all people. So for me, that's an incredibly um, hopeful and, and important development over the last little while.